it's just really a group of people like yourself who get together uh, and really a focus on sharing collaboration around innovation and human resources. I found in getting kind of like mind like minded people together to share is is really helpful. Which is where Wayne and I became most uh, closely affiliated. Um, and again, uh, this is mostly to give due credit to my my colleagues. Um, so the Create Project, uh, you can find it at create.net on the web. Um, and then you, if you go to Amazon, there's also an ebook that uh, my colleagues Ian Ziskin and Carolyn Rerick and I edited called Black Holes and White Spaces, and that's free to download. Um, so the, some of the ideas we'll talk about um, today it emerged from the Create Project. That project is is now, um, I, I would say, completed in its original form. We, we kind of ran it for about two or three years, and that, that, that concluded about three years ago. Um, and so Ian and I, and, and there's still a number of the people in Create, like Wayne, have taken the ideas and run with them. Um, there's, uh, and, and you can, uh, there's a LinkedIn group uh, that you can search, and there's some activity there. So basically, I would encourage you on Create, go to create.net to see the web page we created to hold everything that people invented. Uh, take a look at the book, Black Holes and White Spaces, and you'll get a strong idea about what Wayne and others who were involved in that project put together. Not so much my ideas, but some really terrific ideas from this group of, of agile inventors and teams to think about how we, how we accelerate the HR profession. I had found that, um, you know, I might focus on agile, uh, but um, I had realized that, um, you know, the whole world of AI and automation is, is another area of HR we need to address. And I view agile as kind of the implementation, implementation tool of some agile uh, from AI and automation. And I thought that John, um, who I admire a lot, can give us kind of an overview of the whole, how do you deconstruct work? How do you, you know, it's one thing to talk about AI, but how do you fit it in with um, your regular work, BAU? How do you fit it in with what the HR business partner does? How do you fit it in with, you know, um, work and automation, things like that? You know, one of the fundamental principles is that this, this HR stuff is largely about uh, beyond HR, that is about leaders, uh, workers, et cetera. I think that's only become more true over the 20 or 30 years since Pete and I started playing with these ideas. Um, the, um, uh, the, the idea here is that, that I think HR has an op a, goal, a really good opportunity to be a leader in thinking through things like work automation and the future of work and the way we're going to engage workers in different ways. Uh, I think that's part of the reason this CREATE consortium came together is that other much smarter people than me, uh, CHROs and others, said that unfortunately the profession probably isn't. Um, it isn't where it needs to be in order to take that role on, and, and they were quite dedicated in working out how to do that. So the second, the second idea here, uh, the first idea is that leaders have choices, and they may not realize that they have choices, but they do. Uh, there is no requirement that you automate work to the maximum degree. There is no requirement that you wait until the work is automated to engage workers in, in the process of that automation and give them options. Um, there, there is no requirement that you um, optimize to lowest cost or greatest efficiency or something like that. Um, not all leaders fall into those traps, but a lot of, I think a lot of organizations do. They begin work automation project or, or even worker engagement projects with a discipline like operations or IT or procurement. Those are all great professions. Those are all great disciplines and they have a lot to offer HR. That said, approaching uh, things like work automation and, and work redesign through those lenses can sometimes lead to some unanticipated uh, and sometimes not good consequences. So what, first of all, what are the values, principles, frameworks, and decision rules that leaders are using? And then what, what, are, what are the same ones that they should be using? Uh, and will the HR profession be a place where the, the decision makers, let's say, look for guidance? And, and again, you could to overcharacterize quite drastically, but the idea would be, will leaders first go to something like an IT operations uh, group and say that that's who I'm going to work with on automate on work automation, for example, 
uh, will they first go to an engineering group and say, that's the group I want to work with on Agile, or will we see a point where uh, HR is, is as prominent as those disciplines and where leaders naturally say, well, one of my first stops, if not the first stop, needs to be this profession we call HR because they have frameworks, values, decision uh, frameworks, et cetera, that have proven useful. And, and we can see more if we, use, if we include them or maybe even start with them. So that's kind of the theme for today is to share with you some of the frameworks that, um, that I've developed, but mostly to give credit to uh, my colleagues who have helped me develop those. And Wayne and I'll try and do that in a conversational way. Um, uh, Pete Ramstead and I were certainly not the first ones to recognize it, but I think we first realized how vital it was this principle of deconstruction um, came up for us in the mid 90s, probably actually, um, as we were writing our first book, Beyond HR. And some of you may, you know, again, it's been around a long time. Some of you, therefore, may recall examples like the Disney Sweeper, the Boeing Engineers, et cetera. And I've done work with, you know, gosh, probably at least tens, maybe maybe 100 companies uh, to do that. And, and, and this deconstruction idea is pretty simple. Basically, it involves saying we need to take whatever we're working on, let's take a job, we need to deconstruct the job, which means letting all its pieces, I like to say today, live on their own. So in the, in the good old days, when Pete and I wrote the book, we would break down the job of sweeper at Disney, for example, and we would say, look, there's a sweeping component to it, and then there's an interfacing with guest component to it. And if you let those two things live on their own, you can actually realize that the payoff function to the two parts is very different, and that gives you some insights into where you, know, where you would put your attention. Now, over time, that, that it turns out that deconstruction concept has turned out to be pretty central to some of the more recent books that I've done with Robin J. Suthasen and others on, uh, on thinking about how we engage new types of workers uh, beyond employees and how, and more recently, how we automate. Now, I, what I really like about today is that that deconstruction concept also fits Wayne's framework and I think other frameworks that have to do with Agile, where we take a project and we break it into its parts in order to see more clearly uh, how, how we might approach it and then we reconstruct that project once we understand how the different parts ought to be, ought to be done. So that's kind of what I mean by deconstruction. And I think it was Robin J. Suthasen and I that sort of coined that word to capture the notion of if you're, you know, and, and the, the implication is that if you're trapped, if you're trapped in a system that requires you to think about work as embedded in the job, and that all these pieces have to go together and we, and then that you find a complete human to do that job. And very often we then offer an employment contract to that human, that that is a, that is a pretty draconian way to bundle up work. And what we're finding is that to see the patterns, whether it's in engaging new types of workers, whether it's new types of organization, you need to deconstruct those elements. And that's pretty courageous because it means you have to anticipate HR systems that are not only agile in the sense of, of, of changing rapidly and of being responsive to uh, customers or constituents, but also are agile in the sense of being willing to reconstruct the work uh, and basically say, you know, 30% of what used to be your job is now going to be done by automation or by a worker of a different type. What are we going to do with you now that, the, now that we've got 70% left? Um, and I can see, you know, I think others are starting to pick up on this idea, whether they talk about a task based approach to HR, whether they talk about a skill based economy, uh, all those kinds of things, I think, are are elements of this concept of, you know, we're really we must deconstruct if we're going to see the patterns. We're going to look at a typical HR business partner and try to deconstruct that word. Have you seen any examples of what companies have pulled out, what they've left in, you know, in, in terms of practical examples yet? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Wayne. And to be honest, it's not, I mean, it's a really good question. It's not one that I have a lot of, um, you know, that I've done a lot of work on recently. Um, you know, I think from my own focus tends to be on how business partners can ask these questions more effectively so that leaders are comfortable deconstructing other work. But it's an interesting one. You know, I think, I think the classic you know, really, since Dave Ulrich wrote about this stuff in the in the 80s or 90s, 
you know, the, the notion of, that there are, um, and that there are lots of pieces to that HR business partner role. Uh, Pete and I sort of broke it down. You know, you can think about the business partner as having one role is to be an interface between the rest of HR and the business. So in some ways, they're a translator and implementer, someone who brings the kind of the magic of HR to the business unit. Another, another role is some kind of a strategic partner role where they hopefully uh, unearth elements of strategy that are, that are uh, important when you see them through a, a work or a work lens uh, that might not be seen by, by their business constituents if they were using other disciplines. I kind of talked a lot about that in retooling HR. Um, you know, another one is to sort of be eyes and ears. Uh, people talk about employee advocate traditionally, et cetera. We're hearing a lot now about HR's role in things like the Me Too movement and, and other things like that where that would that, – and I think you could so, – so, again, you could, you could imagine that you could take all of those things and say, okay, there's a sort of eyes and ears component. There's an advocacy component. There's a, uh, a new insights on strategy component, and there's this connecting what HR can do into what the business does. All of those, to me, would have could have very different payoff functions, dep- depending on the strategic situation. Uh, you might very well sometimes say, what I really need is someone who's great at helping us implement the great HR that we have. And to be honest, I'll take a mediocre strategist, because that is not where I need, that's not my pivot point. Other mm-hmm. units would say, no, I'm fine on implementing HR. I will, I'm willing to take a moderately good implementer, but what I really need is a strategist to sit next to me and to help me see my strategy differently. Honestly, in, in some, some organizations, what you really need is someone who's eyes and ears, someone who, you know, where you think about, we've got a troubled unit. Uh, mm-hmm. Perhaps we've had some issues about uh, discrimination, exploitation, et cetera. People don't trust this organization. You might say there, you know, listen, I, I need a moderately good strategist. I need a moderately good service deliverer. But what I really need is someone everybody trusts to listen and to give us confidence that we're, that we're paying attention, that we're in compliance, et cetera. So hopefully that's, you know, that's kind of off the cuff, Wayne. Thank yeah, you for the yeah, question. Spot there, but, um, you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of CHROs, as you do, and, you know, one of the considerations is, um, you know, the change in the roles of, of, of the business partner and, you know, implementing technology and, and bots and things mm-hmm. like that handle routine, you know, work, and then it leaves the HR uh, business partner to do more strategic stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, then the challenge is, does that HR business partner have the capabilities and skills to do that? And so as I think about that role, you know, each organization is going to have to go through a, a, I guess, a strategy around, you know, what are my kind of routine jobs and what are my uh, mm-hmm. strategic jobs and then look at each person individually and then, you know, aggregate everybody else and figure out, you know, where we apply. And so is that, is, have, how have companies kind of prepared to, to implement uh, AI and automation in HR? Have you kind of seen some examples? It's been more successful, it's more prevalent. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, uh, yes, and I think a lot of this is kind of available out on the web. There's obviously a, a massive, massive venture capital investment in HR technology, and anybody who's been to, I think, and maybe going on now, the HR tech conference, for example, can encounter uh, the kind of can just experience the vast array of applications, the vast array of systems, everything from big players like Workday, uh, who are often acquiring some of the smaller players, Workday or SAP, Oracle, et cetera, um, to very small players who are in, in, in you know, developing games and other things. Um, so I, and, I, and I think it is kind of a fascinating issue inside the profession is to apply some of the principles that we may talk about a little bit later here to the work of HR. So if you take something like recruiting, which is probably the poster child for yeah. work automation in HR, um, you know, you can imagine you can imagine thinking of it as taking the job of a recruiter with all the different elements. There might be 30 or 40 of them. And then going through that, and, and I think what we're seeing is it's becoming pretty apparent that things that used to traditionally be done by a recruiter can now, a human recruiter, can now be done by automation. Now, that's not yeah. the whole job. Uh, but certainly, you know, identifying candidates, uh, responding in, 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 in uh, kind of standard ways with making sure letters get written, making sure responses get written. There are, uh, there are, uh, there is software now that claims to be able to 
look at the emotions of someone. If they send you a video uh, interview of some kind, there is certainly software that can pretty efficiently go through and, uh, and scrape the web for qualifications, et cetera. There's a great deal of dis discussion about that, about a kind of bit Bitcoin-based verifiable qualification set where you don't have to have an interview to do that. You don't have to look at a resume, et cetera. So I, you can imagine that what's going on there is where, and the way I would sort of think of it is we're sort of looking at this recruiter job and we're going to end up saying 30 or 40 percent of what used to be done by a human is now going to be done much better and much more efficiently by automation. Now that leaves 60 percent um, and, uh, and, and that 60% we have to think about now, do we continue to pay our recruiters the same amount of money to do the 60% because the automation makes us so much more efficient that we can afford to do that? Or are there opportunities, and I think there are, the, the, the interesting ones that Rob and I, and I have written about is when you transform the work and you essentially create superhumans that could only exist because of automation. And, and so that you, your, your best recruiter gets automatically routed to talk to people that are your best candidates, for example. And you just couldn't do that in a world where you didn't have automation to help make that match. Your recruiters have information at their fingertips. They get nudges about what they ought to ask about, what they ought to mention based on what the automation has discovered about the candidate. And that makes any recruiter you encounter as a human recruiter becomes kind of superhuman compared to what they, only your only the top two percent might have been able to do that in the in the non automated world, and now everybody can. Where does HR fit in all this? You know the role of HR leadership in the work automation process. What is, what examples have you seen? What, what you know, Robin and I have, let me, why don't I have you go just one slide up, Wayne, to slide sure. nine, which uh, where I've, I've kind of summarized the, um, summarized the steps that we talk about in the book. And as, as those of you who can see the screen, and, and I'm happy to make a PDF, uh, but it's really in the book. You know, what we've already talked about this notion of deconstruction, and, and Robin and I have pretty strongly believe it's not just us. We and a lot of other people now are concluding that you just can't see these patterns unless you deconstruct. Um, and then once you do, the second idea would be that you think about what is the payoff function? I, we, I call it now return on improved performance. What does that curve look like? So it's, it's very different if you're automating to get rid of mistakes. Let's say at the very left side of the curve, we have poor performance, that performance costs us because of mistakes, and we want to get rid of that. That's one, one reason to automate. Another reason to automate is more in the middle of the curve where you say, you know, we're actually, people do this job many, many different ways. None of it really creates any higher or lower payoff, but uh, we, can, we could normalize that. We could standardize that. Another part of the curve is where, where someone is doing the work, and we're going to make their work faster, more efficient, uh, less costly, et cetera. So it's the same work, and with automation, we're going to help them do it better. And then there's the right-hand side of the curve, which would define the highest levels of performance we have. And very often, the payoff function on the right side goes, goes vertical, where the superheroes in this job actually produce 10 times what others might produce. So what I'm saying there is, it really depends on what you're trying to get done with automation. If you're automating at that right-hand side of the curve and trying to create superhumans, that's a really different idea than automating at the left side of the curve where you're trying to get rid of mistakes. And we, Robin and I give a lot of examples, and we could think of examples in HR. You know, all we're trying to do is make sure that our recruiters properly uh, get the, the documentation done, you know, mm -hmm. so that we're in compliance. Well, that's kind of a left side of the curve thing. Nobody's gonna change the world doing better documentation, but if it isn't done, you really want to, and so you might automate there. And then the third one, and the third and fourth, the third one is really, I won't talk too much about it, it's kind of Robin's expertise, but what automation options do we use, and then reinvent the work. Uh, so now that we've done the automation, let's put the work back together so that the human part of it better fits the humans, the automation part better fits automation, et cetera. So I would say, Wayne, in answer to your question about where does HR play in this, this is one of a number of frameworks that I think HR can bring to the table and that I think HR systems ought to be more, um, uh, shall I say, more explicit about. So when leaders have work to be done, just to, to way over-characterize, one, one way to approach that is to say, well, the HR system will bring you a set of job descriptions, and it's up to you to decide which of the jobs best fit the work that you need done. And then we're gonna go recruit entire human beings 
who sign up for an employment contract that says that's the job they do. The system I'm describing here would say to the leader, bring me the work you need to get done, and then we're going to deconstruct it into the right, into the right level of elements. We're then going to work through a framework like this that says, what's the payoff function? What are the automation options? We're going to make some decisions about what to automate, and then we're going to have the courage to look at that and say, wow, we really don't have a whole job anymore. We have 40% of a job. Now, what are we going to do to make that 40 into 100 for the human worker? And then how are we going to implement the automation? So you can see this is what I mean. This, is, this to me is a very different decision framework, a very different way to encourage leaders to think about work, I think, and one that doesn't fit most systems today. That there are very, very few HR systems. There are some, but there are very few that are really prepared to operate at the level of deconstructed elements that we're constantly constructing and reconstructing into what we might call new jobs or reconstructed jobs. Yeah. Most systems have a hard time doing that. Even, even if the elements are there, they are not the elements that leaders are encouraged to work on. It's still bundled into jobs, et cetera. So that would be one. That's kind of the deconstruction theme. And then the return on improved performance is, is you could think of that as another framework. We don't just assume every part of a job pays off if people do it better. You know, we're willing to say certain parts of the job, once you're, once you're moderately good, that's good enough. Move on to other stuff that pays off more, that kind of thing. You know, it's interesting because if you look at any, you know, if you look at any particular job or a person, are we really 100% productive? Are we really using s in, in all pieces of the mm -hmm. work? And the answer is likely no, right? And so hopefully there's more of the job that use your talents, but it's never going to be 100%. So what you're saying is if I'm 60%, you know, productive in my role, my talents, then that or, or the other 40% might be better off automated or uh, using some other systems to help so that I can mm -hmm. spend 100% of my time on the skills that are really, you know, my, my talents and my skills. And, you know, so it brings up a good point about FTEs and organizational charts, you know, that, that typically are bodies in, in a role. And so now, you know, I guess you're saying the, audit, the, the job description of the future, uh, the, the organizational chart of the future is going to be a lot different than it is today. The organizational chart of future is going to be a lot different than it is today. Yeah, even if it's even an organization chart, you know, and I think we're starting to see a good deal of discussion uh, about that as well. Uh, a lot of very smart people kind of tackling. I mentioned the work of Chris Worley and Sue Mormon at the center just as one example. But I think the whole notion of an organization, Wayne, starts to change pretty fundamentally. Uh, often in ways that are somewhat familiar, uh, for example, social networks, this is something that the create group worked on a lot, you know, it's so it's very easy now to get connected socially much more than it was traditionally. And you don't need an organization to do that. You don't need the organization to find the people that you'll connect with to get your work done. It's often available pretty easily on the web or in some sort of social network framework. So, you know, my colleague Rob Cross and Ron Bird and others Michael Arena, who's working with us at the center now, uh, they, they've, all, they've all got wonderful approaches to the social network, independent of the formal organization chart. And again, what some of the things that Rob Cross and I are working on is what happens when you create a social network around a deconstructed concept of work. So, so how, do the, how do the individual capabilities of individuals network together, for example, not just the whole individual sitting in a job, which is often the way that we draw those charts. How does, how does automation fit into a social network? You know, if you drop a bot in that's providing a call center with lots of information, should the bot be regarded as talent in your talent scheme? Uh, in the same way that if you dropped a, gen a genius human who knew all that stuff, you'd have them in as a node in the network. My colleague, again, in the fall, we're having a, a conference in Los Angeles on this. My colleague, Shauna Weblin, who's in Australia, is uh, writes a lot about the idea that our whole lexicon about what do we mean by talent needs to needs to be carefully examined. Uh, and, and again, my favorite experiment is get get whatever group you're getting together next time and ask them, what is our definition of talent? Right. And I, I bet you will find, you know, and, and you'll find that there are definitions all over the map from talent is the most high potential people we have to talent is the inherent capability of everybody. And she raises some great questions about would you include 
automated work, the automated portion of work as part of your talent pool. So yeah, I think you have, if you do that, you start to have some pretty interesting organization implications, boundarylessness, social, and, uh, and, and often empowered by automation so that you don't need things like uh, layers of, of, of supervision to, to translate the message because you can just give the people in the organization. It's very much what traditionally Ed Lawler and Sue Mormon and others worked on in terms of empowering teams back in the Texas Instrument days of the 1970s. Yeah. Let's just let, you know, Japanese management, let's just let the employees stop the line if they can see something. Well, that is now possible on steroids because you can just hand the employees the data about how a product's being used, about how, how customers are reacting, and let the frontline folks organize themselves around what they see. That we talk about in the book, a pretty famous example now of, of Hire Group, um, the appliance company, Chinese appliance company that reorganized that way. Fascinating. So when I have my Monday morning staff meeting, six humans and four bots, I guess, at the table, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of, um, no, that's, how, that's often how physicians work now is that really? you've got five or six physicians around a table and you have IBM Watson, Memorial Sloan Kettering has been doing this for probably five or seven years. Mm-hmm. You have the doctors and you have a conversational AI based on Watson, which was the computer that, that beat the champion at Jeopardy and it could be now the Google one or whatever. And the doctors can turn to that computer and say, has anybody studied this question? Or is there any medical research on this? And the computer in an eye blink goes out, reads the literature, and can come back in a conversational way and say, these are the, these are the three top findings of the literature that you asked me about. Uh, and again, you, if you think about that, if you're the doctor that used to be good at looking up stuff on the web, yeah. then you've got a pretty disruptive moment in your life in terms of what work am I going to do in the future? On the other hand, if you're the doctors that rely on that information, you just made that every group of doctors superhuman because they're all going to be great at seeing things on the web and translating them in a way that they never could before. I know that some organizations have uh, focused on, um, you know, internal free agents. Uh, mm-hmm. Yep. I think Intel and others have done that, right? And so I guess yeah. that's kind of a Kelly. step in the way because they're not really assigned to work per se projects. Um, right. Have yeah, you seen that? Kelly, one of our, one of our right. colleagues, uh, Kelly Stephen Weiss at here yeah. in California, who was one of the instrumental folks in the Create Project. Um, I, I understand that, um, I think it was, um, I believe it was Edie Goldberg was telling me about it. And I think they've got a book coming out about this. Um, both of them. I'm pretty sure I've got that right. Apologies to Edie if not, but I think that's right. Um, but anyway, Kelly has developed this idea of kind of free agency and task-based work uh, to a platform that they use it here. Disney has one. Uh, places like Accenture, Towers Watson, and others are beginning to experiment. This IBM has a very well-developed one. And so you can think about an organization of essentially people who, who, are, who, are, who interface more like freelancers. You, you put deconstructed projects up, people can, can offer their services, uh, the system kind of puts those things together, and that's the way that people have, very often it's even applied to employees. So you do have a regular employment contract, but the way we decide what work you're doing is going to be more in this freelance way. And again, in the, in the book before the Reinventing Jobs book, rather than I wrote a book called Lead the Work, and that was more about the, the alternative ways of engaging humans. Um, in, um, uh, in, in, in work with a number of things like contractors, volunteers, and one of the prominent ones being freelancers. So you're right, there is kind of a, not only is there a freelance ecosystem that Create talked about of external workers that can yeah. engage with you on a project by project basis, and, and then they're kind of, it's up to them to figure out how to organize their professional life and their employment life. But, but a lot of organizations often actually now begin by um, asking their internal employees to behave more like freelancers and allowing the work to be a deconstructed set of tasks that organize based on the market internally. Yeah. It makes a lot I'm of not sense. Sure. I, 
Yep, I saw John Younger on the list. I'm not sure if John is with us today, but John has also written a great deal in his concept of agile work um, uh, if, about that idea and about how, how I, I, again, I don't want to presume too much, but my yep. reading of his work is that there's a kind of similar theme of deconstruction there and of, of kind of letting, letting a, a, a market of capabilities and needs form and tell us what the work should look like. Yeah, there's, you know, I think that where I would start, Wayne, there, there actually is a great deal out there to help HR leaders think this through. Um, some of the most prominent services that are being offered in this way are actually emerging from some of the, um, I guess, for want of a better word, I'll say temporary help. But uh, organizations like Manpower Group, for yeah. example, yeah. Uh, but then many others, too. I don't want to just say exclusively there, but a lot of those organizations have for decades, really, been managing an alternative workforce, often a contractor workforce on behalf of the organization. So they provide a service that says we'll find and manage and vet uh, uh, these contractors, well, they've evolved rather predictably and quite naturally and appropriately. They've evolved often to say, you know what, we can actually offer you a one-stop platform where we'll, we'll, we'll combine all of the kinds of workers that you have or that are available to you, and you bring us the work you need to do, and we'll help you decide what should be a freelancer, what should be a contractor, what should be an employee. Another neat place to work where lots of stuff is very, very well established and well tested is the freelance platforms themselves. I happen to know Stefan Kasrael, who's the CEO of Upwork, so Upwork is prominent in my mind, but there are lots of other such platforms. But again, what you find there, and Robin and I wrote about this and David Krillman in Lead the Work, is, is that they often provide an interesting model because they, as a business model, have had to figure things out like in the intellectual property protection, uh, how to define an employee versus contractor, how to stay within the, the rules and regulations of every state, how to define work in a way that a whole population of people can understand what we mean and can know whether they're qualified or not, how to let the, how to let the ecosystem know that something is emerging, maybe a new software program or something, and get them to train themselves on that. All of that stuff is pretty prominent and has been happening for a long time in the freelance platform world. And again, not surprisingly, uh, colleagues like Stefan Kosriel and, and um, Rob Biederman at a company called Catalan, they're, they're all finding that increasingly organizations are saying, well, can't you, can't you take that knowledge, can't you take that platform and let me combine all of my potential ways of working? Um, so if you look inside companies, uh, P&G uh, was is kind of famous for this mall that, that, um, that, that they developed, and you think about it like a shopping mall, one anchor store is employment, regular employment. One anchor store is contractors. Those are the big stores on each end. But in between are these boutique stores, maybe a freelance platform, maybe a, a boutique a crowdsourcing platform, et cetera. And the beauty of it is that HR vetted all the shops in the mall so that a leader can confidently come to this mall now and they can pick and choose or be, be guided by HR to think through which stores in the mall would be the best source of each piece of deconstructed work. And the beauty for the leadership is HR has already vetted this. So if you choose one, we've already taken care of a lot of the legal issues, a lot of the IP issues, et cetera. Um, again, Disney has, Disney has a similar initiative going on there. So there's really quite a lot. I'm sure I'm not even capturing. I bet some of the people on the phone have initiatives like this. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, this, 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 I think it's, it's not going to affect all work. I think that's the other important thing to say, Wayne, there's going to be plenty of work that is going to be quite easily and appropriately managed as regular full-time employees doing a job. Yeah. So I think one of the things that for me came out of the create project was that the future is going to be unevenly distributed and it should be. And so the re another really fundamental framework that people ought to, um, think about is how do we get leaders to understand how to look at work and how to know which work should be done traditionally. That's fine, you know, and we shouldn't be pushing them to move to these futuristic approaches. On the other hand, there are other parts of work where unless you move to the future, you're not going to be able to keep up. You just can't fill requisitions that fast. You can't move that fast to train people. So I think a really important role for HR is to bring a framework that, and if you go read the Create book, you'll see some frameworks that they develop. 
to, to help leaders begin to say, where in my domain is the work that needs some of these future approaches? And where is the work that, frankly, I shouldn't be wasting my time pushing too hard yet because it doesn't, it hasn't evolved to a point where we need that. We can manage it as in traditional ways. And um, as someone who works with companies to deconstruct and reconstruct their narrative, both internal and external, how do you see organizations dealing with and overcoming the fear? Which obviously is uh, any change, um, you know, there's a fear involved. Do you have yeah. any thoughts around that, John? You know, I, I, yeah, it's a really good question, and I'm not going to claim to be an expert, though it is a question that I've written a lot about because it's on my mind. So I love the question. And I'm glad it was the first question. I think it's a very fundamental question that is often currently overlooked um, and, I, and, and that therefore needs more attention from HR, et cetera. On the one hand, we have decades and decades of research on how to engage workers in the work that they do and how to give them the freedom and the empowerment to help the organization understand uh, their experience of work. And I think, you know, there's clearly a huge upwelling now of attention to something called the, the employee experience. I would, you know, I'll be over in London in September talking to a group over there, and I think we're going to try and shift that to be the worker experience. But the idea would be, you know, so, so the idea is that that experience is pretty fundamental. Um, the way I would put it, so the way you deal with the fear, I think, and again, a lot of you are much more expert than I am on change management, et cetera. But for me, one of the principles is that you need to get, the, get individuals involved early. Uh, you need to give them opportunities to see what's coming in the future and hopefully with enough time and enough resources to make, to, to make good choices about how they want to fit in that. Uh, we might call it my colleague Robin J. Suthafson is writing a lot about reskilling. Lots of others are too. I'm not sure reskilling is the be all and end all of this. I think it's more fundamental. But I think, Wayne, it, one of the things I would say in a nutshell is I would be pretty surprised if I'm wrong when I say most organizations don't start soon enough and that they don't give the, the workers enough of a framework to think through the kinds of adjustments they could make. I think it's still fair to say that in a lot of organizations, whether it's work redesign with alternative workers or whether it's automation or both, I think in many organizations, those processes start in another discipline like procurement or IT and that the workers involved don't get, don't hear about it and they're not invited to engage with it until way too late when the only options available are to, to try to reskill desperately quickly or to right. humanely get rid of them because they are, they're obsolete. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think, I think it's a very important area for HR leaders to think about. I'm doing a little bit of writing on it with my colleague, Ben Schneider at the center is what, what kind of a culture, what kind of systems do we put in place so that we have the courage and, and the capability to start talking early. You know, from a good, good example, here's a, here's a, a silly example. But when the robot that can flip hamburgers was invented, this is now five or seven years ago, big headlines, there's a robot that can flip hamburgers. Lots of demonstrations, lots of videos, and the robot cost a fortune. And so any hamburger that you, that you purchased that a robot made was going to have to cost $300. You know, that's the economic break-even point. Well, one reaction can be, oh, that's all fine. I don't, if, you're, if you're a worker who flips hamburgers or you're a leader of those workers, one reaction is, you know, we don't have to worry about this. This is just some super costly, weird anomaly. Well, however, we all know that once it's invented, it is only a matter of time and probably quicker than we think that that robot will be cost-effective and that the people who flip hamburgers are going to be, part of their work is going to be replaced by a robot. I would argue that when that robot first appears, organizations ought to be talking with the workers who flip hamburgers and saying, how are we going to get together, the organization and the workers, and get the adjustment made in time for the robot to appear here? Because it is going to happen. It is going to arrive. So you see what I mean? There's, I think in most organizations that culture doesn't exist Data from the Pew Research Group suggests that the population, at least in the U.S. as a whole, vastly favors regulations that prevent companies from automating if it's going to harm workers or that restrict companies to automating only the dirty and dangerous work. That is a, like the vast majority of people asked in a Pew Research study a few years ago said, I would, I would favor legislation that prevents automation unless it's the dirty, dangerous work 
or prevents or, or, or requires organizations not to automate if it's going to harm human workers. I don't think most organizations realize just how pervasive that view is and how much it limits what they learn from their workers about what they know about how we could best automate or use alternative work arrangements because the workers are afraid that they'll be treated badly if they reveal that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, another question from Julie, basically, I think she says, you know, where do you get started? Mm -hmm. um, start this process. You know, where would you begin? Um, who would involve function, things like that? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great question, Wayne, and I'm going to I'm going to tell the group that they're they're lucky to be affiliated with Wayne, uh, because I think and I, Wayne, maybe we can move back up to that slide. I want to give that some airtime, like the slide where you had listed your EBITDA, um, yeah. Yeah. your EBITDA. I encourage you to just jump up there for those that are looking at the screen, but yeah. also share it, you know, um, and so. You know, I think Wayne has captured a lot of the elements that I would talk about. Uh, I, first of all, and again, I'm gonna, I won't use Wayne's language as well as he will use. <laughs> well, yeah, you, well, you think about the experimentation idea that we're not looking for perfection. And to me, and, and break down the big projects into smaller components, that's the E and the B of EBITDA for Wayne. And I think that that's, that, that's so, um, I think that you should get started where the need is greatest. And that means experiment where there's openness to experimentation and don't feel like you have to do this for the entire worker population or for all the work in your organization. So have the courage to say, there's a heat map, so to speak. There's a topography here. And in that topography, there are these peaks where we are already unable to do the work. You know, go there. You know, start there. In, in my colleagues who run these uh, platforms and are selling them to organizations, they'll often just go to the CEO and say, tell me the work where your requisitions have been, been open for more than 20 weeks. Tell me the work where you are constantly playing catch up trying to keep people skilled as the work changes. And they're not talking to the HR lead. They're often talking to the CEO or other C-suite folks because once the CEO, I, let's say the CEO, identifies those spots, then there's no question about, well, should we or could we or do we need it? It's obvious that the traditional work system isn't working. So I would say one very big thing is to step back and as an HR community, get together and privately think about in our, you know, being honest with ourselves, where is our current system failing us? Open requisitions forever, mm -hmm. skills that aren't keeping up, change that's happening too fast, and privately just do the thought experiment within your HR community and say, what if we thought about, in this case, some of the things John is talking about, alternative work arrangements, automation, what if we applied a few of those frameworks? What would we say is the place where it's obvious that there's almost no downside because we're in such such pain right now that people are ready to try stuff, you know, I mean, and I think that's how the most successful HR organizations do it. Again, Wayne, I think you've really picked up, do it iteratively, do it in short blocks of time so that you can find successes. A lot of stuff that is very, you know, very common in change management models. And again, I think either the frameworks I'm presenting or frameworks that some of you have developed would allow you to look at these things incrementally in deconstructed parts, find quick wins, et cetera. I think what's often missing is a, a, a framework or a way to, to identify those and then to think about how to approach them. A lot of stuff's overwhelming. Uh, it's a lot of stuff going at HR leaders constantly. You know, business as usual is it's hard to even sustain that, right? Because there's so much happening and, and uh, you know, people, the ability to step back and be proactive and, and, and do the things you're talking about, John, you know, is first of all, who has time? Who's the individual is going to do it? You know, um, we have a lot of good intentions, but, you know, you give someone a project to do and then six months later, nothing gets done because they've been busy, you know, so I, I yeah. It's a, it's a, that's why I think agile, you know, biased obviously, but I think it allows the, an increase of capacity and capabilities because it, and there is a little bit of a startup cost. There's no question. It is a little bit of a time consumption, but you basically wind up being more efficient, more productive, doing more in less time. So, but you got to make that switch from working in HR to working on HR, right? And I'm afraid that, most of our colleagues are stuck inside and not really working on it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know how you get beyond that, if you have any examples, or where have you seen people have changed that kind of paradigm, but maybe it's the culture you talk about. You know, I think so, Wayne. I, I would say it kind of the, the research that Ed Lawler and I do, and I expect many of the folks on the call have received a link to the survey that we're doing of, of HR, one that we do every three years. And, and one of the big findings of that, Wayne, is, uh, is the background for my answer, which is that I, I think of it like an iceberg of HR. And, and there's extraordinary work in HR going on everywhere from a small company with one HR leader and maybe less than 20 employees, all the way up to the headline companies. And that's the part of the iceberg that appears above the water, companies that, that we work with, like whatever it might be, Google, Starbucks, Amazon, IBM, Accenture, Towers, Watson, et cetera. And those appear above the waterline. You know, and, and, and I think you can look to them for examples, but, uh, but rightfully so, a lot of HR leaders are going to say, well, I'm not that big. I don't have those kinds of resources. In any case, I think that, I think those examples are telling. And I think for, you know, I get it, although I'm not doing the work, you're all kind enough to let me in your club. Um, but I think, I think successful HR organizations will take those dilemmas. We've already got a train we have to keep running. We're busy enough just trying to do HR, not necessarily work on HR, as you said. And I think it's still important to, to I, I think you, that they should just carve out time, even if it's to work inside the HR community, but carve out time to get together and say, where could we showcase our ability to apply these sorts of things in our own work? Like I said, yeah. recruiting, but it might not be recruiting. It might be development. It might be even rewards. Um, you know, where can we apply some of these frameworks and showcase how much better work can be inside our function? That would be one way to start. I think, again, the, the other way to start is um, to find the places where leaders already recognize that the current system isn't working. And instead of avoiding that or trying to rationalize it, to embrace it and say, well, you know, that's why we, that's why we in HR are asking you to provide us resources in terms of space, money, time, et cetera, uh, and because we're going to work on this. And then the final one, Wayne, I think came out of the Create Project, which is to pull in resources from other functions. Uh, you know, some of these problems are a perfect thing to put an engineer on. Again, big company, to be sure, big, rich organization. But Scott Petaskey at Amazon has a dedicated set of data analytics folks that are HR people that are their data analytics folks. That's their discipline, but they live in the HR function. They're paid by the HR function. They report to Scott. And in the same way, we might think about this work we designed, the notion of automation. Should we, should we um, second, have as a convent some of our best uh, automation experts and bring them in and make them HR professionals or bring them into the HR profession. And I think that's another way where you then have resources inside the profession that you're not waiting in line at the IT department, for example, yeah. or at the automation function, waiting yeah. for them to say, let's give priority to an HR project, but, but maybe make the case that one or two of those folks inside dedicated to what HR does might move the needle some and give you some yeah. early wins. I'm an HR leader. You know, I've, I've been to um, been hearing about these new things or all the greatest things in sliced bread. You know, there's a variety of things. Convince me or, or you know, it's like, my business is doing fine. You know, I'm struggling, but I'm okay. You know, my people mm -hmm. are happy to see I doesn't want much from me. Why should I be concerned? You know, why, why would I change something where I'm doing fine right now? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, one part of me wants to say, look, if that's really true, then I don't know that I would go looking for trouble. Okay. Um, so, so, and I think then, then you go one concentric circle out and you say, well, okay, let's consider how you might, how it might not be quite so rosy. I, I think for me, a bottom line is if that was really true, then I don't know that I would recommend going and looking for trouble. But okay. one concentric circle is we may be fine today, but are, do we anticipate being fine tomorrow? Yeah. And there's plenty of data to suggest that when you reframe the question that way, almost every business leader will say, we're not ready. 
and and I know that we have some significant gaps, and I or, or that there's things that we're just not ready for. We found that in the Create work. You can read some really good essays in the Black Holes and White Spaces book about that. Wayne was involved in one team that asked CEOs and others about that. So I think that's the next step would be you look for the gap. I think you know it, is is it possible? Do you really want to be sitting there saying, well, I'm fine, and nobody's asking me for anything, so I guess we're not in trouble? I think almost everyone would say them not asking you is not the is not the indicator uh, that very often people don't know what they need and they don't know it until they bang into it. And your job is to help ask questions that get them to see it. So and then I think, again, I'm a big fan of going where the gap is. Um, So I, I think you really I guess what I would say to someone like that, Wayne, is to say, you know, is it possible that this idea that everything is just fine and we'll wait until we hear from someone that they need something is, are you going to have the time you need to answer that request unless you start now? You know, do, are you really comfortable that if you wait till the CEO gets smart enough about this to say, I need something, or is that going to put you in a world where they say, I need it tomorrow? And is that the world you want to live in? Uh, and if you don't, then it's kind of, again, a lot of this can start privately. And like, I'm not saying you have to go to your CEO and say, I, I, I insist that you tell me where we're in trouble. I think that can be done inside the HR function. You know, so the next HR meeting you have, that's, that's what I often do with organizations is say, you know, let's just sit here and ask. That's what we did in Create. We said, let's, let's step back and ask ourselves, what are the trends that, no, that strategic uh, st- strategies don't talk much about. What are the trends that are going to affect the workforce fundamentally? And even the create group, some of the best CHROs in the world said, even in the companies we work for, our C-suite team and our strategists are missing this stuff. Um, and so maybe you do it privately with your yeah. HR colleagues, and articulate what you mean by the things where you think there's going to be a gap. And that's what you take forward to start a discussion, to find it early enough that you can act on it. I have a culture that asks that question. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Conversation. Um, didn't have a specific agenda other than brainstorming, uh, which, you know, I threw John questions perhaps he didn't uh, expect. And he threw me some things I didn't expect. And that's part of the agile process to really iterate and bounce back and forth. So there's no wrong answer. Um, yep. I learned a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to send everybody a survey tomorrow. If you would mind filling it out, get your feedback. This is a Iterative approach, we're a group of collaborators who are passionate around these things. And I think if we can kind of build a strong community, we can help each other with lessons learned and ideas like this that we articulate. We have a, a, a LinkedIn group. I would you to uh, sign up for that. There's, there's no charge. Everything we do is open source. Just, uh, I learned from John and our goal is to realize um, improvements in HR and health profession get to another level. Um, my contact information is down there. John's also um, questions. And John, really, uh, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed listening to you. You're a uh, phenomenal advisor, mentor, strategic thinker. Uh, I encourage anybody who needs some help or advice uh, to reach out to John. He's a great resource and really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, everybody.